Hi, welcome back to my Smart Learning. It's uh, Science Lessons uh, with Mr. Mian. Uh, this is for Year 9s, but it's also useful for Year 10s and Year 11s for your GCSE Physics and Science, the Trilogy Science. Today we're looking at changes of state and states of matter. So states of matter, looking at solids, liquids and gases, and the changing of state when they change from one state to another. So learning objective, what do substances look like and what happens when they change state? Recall quiz, quick high five, you want your virtual high five from me. So number one, name three fossil fuels. Number two, name three renewable energy resources. Number three, name a greenhouse gas. Number four, what is the order of startup times for power stations? So different types of power stations that we talked about. And the last one, um, what does base load mean? Now, I can't remember if I actually went through that in detail last time, but I'm gonna go through it very quickly. So pause the video, have a go at those, and if you've unpaused it, we can go through the answers now. So the first uh, question, the three fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas. We have to call it natural gas. You can't just say gas, because gas could mean anything. So natural gas. Number two, name the three renewable energy resources, or name any three renewable energy resources. There's not just three, um, but the ones that we focused on in particular was solar power. We had wind power, which worked on uh, wind turbines, but the, the wind also affects waves. So you've got wave power. You've got hydroelectric uh, power through the, through the dams. You've got tidal power, geothermal power, um, and then you've got uh, biofuels as well. So the, any three of those examples. And number three, name a greenhouse gas. The main one is carbon dioxide that you get talked about, but you could have also said methane too. Um, what is the order of the startup times? The one that takes the longest to start up, it takes approximately two days for it to get to the right speed to provide enough power to generate electricity for thousands of homes, is the slowest is the nuclear power station. Next is the coal-fired power station, which can take up to about a day to get started. Next is the oil-fired power station. And the quickest, could take about half an hour up to an hour, is the gas-fired power station. And what does base load mean? The base load is the average uh, usage or the average amount of energy demand across the country when you average it out for, from peak times to uh, off peak times. So during the night when everyone's asleep, the power consumption is very, very low. And during peak times, when people come home from school and work and they cook dinner and they're at home and they're playing their PS4s to whatever time in the morning, I don't know, some people go up to midnight or even later playing, you know, Fortnite, which is dead, some people tell me, or there could be other games like Destiny. Uh, Destiny's dead too, I've heard. Anyhow, um, so when our power consumption is very low during the evening or what, during the night when we're asleep, when we're supposed to be asleep and not playing PlayStation, and it's very high during the early evenings and first thing in the morning when we're getting up to go to school, um, and if you average it all out, you've got times when it's really high, times when it's really low. If you average it out, you get a straight line it's like a mean line. That mean line is the base load. That's what it means. So it's the average energy demand or consumption during the day. There's one other thing I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about from last time. Um, we, I can't remember if we talked about it, the pumped pump storage system. When you look at hydroelectric power stations, when the, they open the sleuth gates at the bottom and the water comes spinning through those little turbines at the bottom and you generate electricity very, very quickly, you make lots of electricity when there's a sudden surge in demand, you can use some of that electricity to pump the water back up to the top because it's remember gravitational potential energy, GPE, that's bringing the water down, driving the kinetic energy, driving those turbines, generating electricity. And you can do that at a flick of a switch so you can get a sudden surge in uh, electricity when there's a sudden demand for it and um, you can use the pump storage system to pump that water back to the top so that next time you get a surge, you've got some water already up there, or else you have to wait for the river to build up behind that dam and fill up that water. So, what we're looking at today then, three states of matter. Now you should have known this or learned this from year seven or eight. The three states of matter are solids, liquids, and gases. 
and you need to know how you draw with the particle diagrams of how you draw what a solid looks like, what a liquid looks like and what a gas looks like. There's also, also sometimes people talk about the fourth state of matter known as plasma, but I'm not going to go into that. That's going to go into sort of like off specifications, we're going to A level uh, speak. But if you want to look at what plasma is, not like blood plasma, there is another type of state where literally atoms get ripped to shreds and their electrons and their protons get ripped apart and turned into a soup, and we call that plasma. Um, and you can see it sort of happening in the sun, and you can see it. Uh, you may have seen those little um, in the gadget shops, those little glass balls and then you switch it on and you put your hand next to it, you get those little purple lines going towards your hands, uh, those little look like electric bolts, that's plasma. So anyway, but we're focusing on solids, liquids and gases. So what do we know about solids? Solids are very difficult to squash, unless it's a sponge, but that's because there's air trapped inside that sponge. Uh, it can't be poured and it can't change shape, okay? Unless it's, you hammer it into shape like a metal car or something like that. But the idea is the solid is a fixed shape and a fixed volume. Liquids have a fixed volume, but they can change shape. So when they go into a container, they take the shape of the container. So they're difficult to squash again. You can't really squash them. Uh, they can be poured because they can flow and they can change shape. They change the shape of the container. Whereas gases are easy to squash because there's so much gaps between those uh, gas particles. They can be poured and they can change shape. They, change, they take the shape of the container as well because they fill the entire space up. Now, um, we call liquids and gases fluids. Why? Because they both flow. So fluids flow, solid is not fluid because it can't flow. Unless you go into tiny little solids like sand, but that's because the individual solid bits that will obviously flow, but that's not still a liquid because it's individual solid bits. Now, particle model then. The particle model is a way of us drawing uh, a diagrams to sh represent what the particles and how they're arranged in solids, liquids and gases. So we use it to explain how the substances are made up of particles. We can't see the particles because they're so small, even with the most powerful microscope, you can't see them. Um, now the particles are attracted to each other. Some particles are attracted strongly to each other and others weakly. So in solids and liquids, well definitely solids, they're attracted strongly toward towards each other and that's why they stay put and stay where they are. Whereas liquids, those forces of attraction get broken and it becomes weaker so the particles can move around freely. In a gas, you, you put so much energy into the system that they, the liquid breaks apart, the particles move away from each other and the whole thing turns into uh, a gas. So the attraction, the intermolecular forces we call it, become very, very weak in a gas. The particles move around, they are described as having kinetic energy. All particles can move, even in very freezing cold temperatures. At the point we call absolute zero, which is if you go minus 273 or 74 degrees Celsius, that's also known as absolute zero. That is so cold that none of the particles have no energy at all and they stop still and they go into what we call stasis. They do not physically move. But that's pretty much impossible to achieve to reach absolute zero. So as soon as something has a little bit of energy, no matter how cold it is, the atoms, the particles vibrate, okay, in a solid, but in liquid they move around freely, which we'll look at in a second. The kinetic energy of particles increases with temperature. So the hotter something gets, the more kinetic energy the particles will get. But we'll focus on that idea in our next lesson when we look at internal energy and specific later to heat. So what does it look like in a solid? In the solid, it's decided to stop working. Let me just restart that. In the solid, the particles vibrate. And now for some reason my flash has decided not to work. But in a liquid, you can see what's happening. There you go. So in a solid, the particles aren't moving around freely, but they're sort of jiggling around in a fixed position. So we call it a fixed position. They're vibrating about a fixed point, but they don't move from place to place. In solids, the particles are arranged in fixed columns and fixed rows. So they're in regular rows and regular columns. So it looks like a cuboid there, okay? And obviously, because there's no gaps between them, you can't compress it, you can't squash it to make it into a smaller space. So that's what solids look like. 
how do liquids look like? Well, they don't move around that quickly, but they are irregular in shape. So there's no columns and rows. They're in random order, but they can move around each other in random motion, in a random arrangement. There is a very, uh, there is a, a force between them that's fairly weak, but it's strong enough to keep them next to each other. So they're actually touching all the molecules in all the particles in water or liquid, sorry, are touching. There are sort of random gaps in between, but they're few and far between. There's not many. And so they can move around into those little gaps and then they move around each other uh, freely. So that's in a, a liquid. So it can't be compressed, but it can change shape. And in a gas though, this is the one where they move around in all different directions randomly and really fast, actually faster than the previous one because the liquid is moving too quickly. It doesn't move that quickly. But in a gas though, they whiz around really, really fast, smacking onto the sides of the container. And we're gonna look at that in two lessons time. We'll look at gas pressure and the causes of gas pressure. But it's to do with the fact that these physical, uh, these particles are physically interacting with the sides of the container and hitting them with force, causing that pressure. But they move around randomly and they move around very quickly and they have massive gaps between them, spaces, and they move in all different random directions. So that's how particles are arranged in a solid, liquid and gas. And you need to be able to draw that. So in a solid, they need to be in rows and columns. So it looks like a grid and they need to be physically touching with no gaps really in between. In a liquid, they need to be touching, but it needs to be looking all random. So you shouldn't be drawing them far apart. They need to be touching all together and occasionally there'll be a gap between some of the particles. In a gas you draw them all far apart uh, and that's it and a very few particles. So that's solids, liquids and gases and to summarize then, solids then. So this is the end of the first part. This is what I'm doing is covering two lessons in your Kabutal textbook. I'm looking at um, states of matter which is the first bit and then the second bit of this lesson is changes of state. So I'll put two lessons into one PowerPoint and one uh, YouTube video. Next time I'm going to put two of the lessons in the YouTube video as well, which will be internal energy and specific latent heat because I can squash it into one lesson. Part of the theory is all about explaining the properties of solids, liquids and gases by looking at what their particles do. So can you see, can you have a go at this writing? I'm going to write out the... Um, paragraph there and these are the words that fit into that space you can either pause the video and have a go at it now but I'm putting the PowerPoint on show my homework so you can do it at your own time so the answers then to the question is in a solid the particles vibrate so that's the first point around a fixed position there is a strong force of attraction between each particle and they are very close together okay so that should be straightforward now what about liquids liquids then we can sometimes use these little uh, little shaky little lines they're showing you how much energy they have so if you look at the solid there's only two there in liquid they should really put three to show that there's more vibration so there's more movement and in a gas they should show even more vibrations like four lines maybe to show that they're whizzing around even faster that's what i tend to do Liquids then, use the words at the bottom here, have a go at it now, pause the video, or you can, if you've got access to show my homework, if you're in year nine, our, our school, then you can uh, do it from the PowerPoint, that's on show my homework. In a liquid, the particles are close together, but can move in any direction. They won't keep a fixed shape, so they won't keep a fixed shape like solids do. Okay, and the last one, gases. In a gas, the particles are very far apart and move quickly, that's there, in all directions. They often collide with each other uh, and because they are far apart, they can be easily... The word's missing there. They can be easily... Should be easily squashed. It can be easily squashed or compressed. So we've used the word fix, we use the word collide, they often collide with each other, they move around quickly. Um, they're close together, they're very, we didn't use the word very, solids. 
Yeah, one of these words is the wrong words for these. But you can see that these should be, they move uh, quickly in all directions, often collide with each other, and they're easily squashed or compressed. Okay, so that's solids, liquids, and gases. Now, if I heat a solid, what happens is that the solid will um, expand. They'll move further apart. Because if I start putting more and more energy into that system, when a solid or liquid or gas heats up, it will start to expand, which means the particles don't individually get larger. The particles don't get bigger. What happens is they spread further apart. Why? Because you're giving them more and more energy by putting heat into the system. They're gaining more energy, more thermal energy stored into them. They vibrate more and then they start to break away and move further apart. And that's known as expansion. The only example where actually liquids that turns into a solid, the other way around, that expands by cooling it down is ice, which is a bit weird. But water cooling water down, if you've ever filled up a bottle with water and put it into the freezer, you'll notice that the, it tries to smash the glass bottle or the, try and get out the top, um, because water actually expands when you freeze it. But other than that example, what you need to know is that all solids, when you heat them, they expand, all liquids when you heat them expand, when you heat gases, they expand, they try to take up more space. And the opposite, when you cool them down, so as liquids and gases, as you cool them down, they contract, they get smaller. Okay. Changes of state then. So we're going to, to finish off this uh, second half of the lesson, changes of state. Quick little starter. Can solids um, flow? Well, obviously, no, they can't. Can a liquid flow? Well, we'll go to this one. Can you squash a solid? No, you can't. Uh, does it take the shape of the container? No, it doesn't. Has it got a fixed shape? Yes, it does. Has it got a fixed volume? Yes, it does. Liquids, you can have a go at this activity before I've gone through the answers, obviously, and then see if you can get this right, and I'll go through the answers now. Liquids, can it flow? Yes, they can. Can you squash a liquid? No, you, well, very, very slightly. Um, it's arguable how much you can squash a liquid, but there is a slight amount of compression in there. Um, does it take the shape of the container? Yes, it does. Is it a fixed shape? No, it isn't. It takes the shape of the container. Has it got a fixed volume? Yes, it does. Gases though, can they flow? Yes, they can, because they're fluids. Can you squash them? Yes, you can. Do they take the shape of the container? Yes, they do. Have they got a fixed shape? No, they don't. And because of that, do they have a fixed volume? No, they don't. You can expand a, a gas. They'll take up the shape of a container, but if you open up the space, they'll expand straight away. Um, okay, now, change of state. Change of state just basically means how a solid will turn to a liquid, a liquid will turn to a gas, and then vice versa, a gas turns into a liquid and a liquid turns into a solid. And you need to know the changes of state. What, how do we label them? Well, when a gas turns back into a liquid, which word do we use from there? Well, we actually call it condensing or condensation. So it's condensing. And what about when a liquid turns into a solid? Let's say steam turns back into water, water turns into ice. Well, if it's turning into ice, what do we call that? Well, it must be water turned to ice cubes. It must be freezing. So this one here is condensation or condensing. This one here is freezing. And the temperature at which it does that, we'll call that the freezing point. And this is the basically the boiling point. The opposite way around. So if I do an arrow from there to there, when the ice turns into water, we call that melting. So that would be called the melting point. Now the melting point and the freezing point is exactly the same temperature because that's the te temperature of the changing state. And here, the reason why I call it the boiling point is because when water turns into steam, it's boiling, okay? It's evaporating. So we call it evaporation or evaporating, but it's also boiling because it's uh, turning from uh, the liquid into a gas. So, this is going on to more about the particles and how they're arranged and this is what we talked about earlier how we draw that these should be actually touching there shouldn't be any gaps between them but only just occasional gaps here and here but all of the particles other than that should be touching so you can work through these so I'll send this and show my homework but what I'm going to have a focus on now is the what happens when a liquid turns into a gas when you heat it it evaporates so we call this the boiling point. Condensation is the opposite way around. When a gas turns, when you cool it down, back into a liquid. So we call that condensation. Freezing is where a liquid will turn 
by cooling it into a solid, so that water into ice. Melting though is exactly the same thing but the other way around. When the solid turns back into a liquid. So when you put heat into it, the heating effect will turn it back into a liquid. So we call that the melting point or the freezing point. So what's happening here? Well, the ice is melting, the ice equals into water, so that's the melting. What about this? The water in the pan is boiling, so that's obviously boiling or evaporating. So we've got the freezing here, and we've got here, we've got melting, where the solid is turning back into a liquid. And that's going to be evaporation. So this is just asking the same questions as before. Now, this diagram here you should be able to do. So if you draw it out quickly, pause the video, draw it out quickly and label the different um, arrows of what you think each of those are. This is the one I haven't gone through, where a solid directly goes straight into a gas. But if you know it already, that'd be excellent. Right, so A, go for the answer now. When the solid turns into a liquid, that must be melting. When, for B then, what about when the liquid turns back into the solid, that must be solidifying or freezing. But what about C, when the liquid turns into a gas, we call that evaporating or boiling. And then D, is when the, lick, when the gas, like steam, turns back into liquid, it's called condensing or condensation. Now, very quickly, before I go on to E, which is another new bit of learning, the boiling and evaporation, they're not exactly the same thing. The boiling point and evaporation don't ex always happen at the same temperature, which sounds a bit odd, but let me give you this example. If, you're, if you've got a pot of water or you've got the kettle on, and then you switch it on and the water starts to steam and come out the top. That water is boiling because that pot of water in the kettle or in the pan and it starts to turn to steam, you've made that water go up to 100 degrees Celsius because the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, water is boiling. Each substance has its own unique number. It's boiling point and it's melting point when they're pure. When they're, well, if you add extra things to it, it changes their temperature which they boil and melt. But when it's pure, water will melt bang on zero and it will m boil bang on 100 degrees Celsius. And vice versa, it will condense back at 100 degrees Celsius and it will freeze from ice, liquid to ice at zero degrees Celsius. Now, so how can boiling and evaporation are the same thing? Well, boiling is when, you, like that, it will turn into steam when you're heating up to that high temperature. Evaporation doesn't have to necessarily happen that way. If you imagine you've got a puddle of water on the pavement outside and it's a nice sunny day today, now is that water going to reach 100 degrees Celsius? If you've put your finger in that water, will it ever reach to such a hot temperature that you'll go, ah, you burn your finger like on a hot cup of tea or something? No. But how come when I go outside later, if there's a puddle there, that water's disappeared? Well, that water has evaporated. It's evaporated. Why? Well, why, what's happened? Well, if you think about the particles, the particles in the liquid are moving around all the time, but the top surface is where the sun is directly acting on. Those particles on the top surface are the ones that can escape and turn into a gas. The ones deeper under the water can't. So the top layer keeps evaporating away because they're gaining loads and loads of energy, kinetic energy, and it breaks away from the liquid and turns into a gas. So technically, evaporation and boiling are not the same thing. So don't get confused between the two it's a very obvious and common mistake to make that calling something the boiling point and evaporation aren't exactly the same thing so you have to be very careful now this last one some solids can directly go miss out the liquid phase and go, go solid gas bang just miss out the liquid phase so a couple of examples um iodine crystals iodine crystals do that if i heat up some iodine solid iodine it goes poof it turns into like a purple vapor purple smoke also dry ice. Now dry ice isn't made from water. It sounds like ice, like water, but it's actually made from solid carbon dioxide. If I heat that up, now you've probably seen, if you came to open evening in the science department, when you come around and look at all of our things that we show on open evening, um, some liquids, some colorful liquids like green, red, uh, blue, 
in a conical flask and there's bubbling of smoke coming out of it. And you think, wow, this looks like one of those mad science things that you see in the movies and stuff. It's a bit of an optical illusion. It's a, not an optical illusion. It's more of a special effects type thing that you see in the movies to make it look like there's a crazy chemical experiment going on. And it's just dry ice. Because dr what dry ice is, solid carbon dioxide, and that freezes at minus, I don't know the exact number, but let's say minus 200 odd degrees, or 150 odd degrees. And what happens is it, it's solid when it's like at minus 100 or whatever temperature, degrees Celsius. But when you put it into room temperature, it automatically just, poof, it just turns into smoke. And you sometimes see those in discos and smoke machines. You see a floor full of smoke like flying around. And all it is is solid carbon dioxide turning directly into a gas. And we call that, we call that sublimation. Sublimation. So sublimation is when it goes directly from a solid, directly to a gas. Now, to finish this off then, I'm going to look at what happens. Now, this is a little practical that you're going to do, um, looking at the melting point and the freezing points of different uh, of substances. So this, uh, here's a little activity. Can you match these up first? Condensation, which one is it? That's right, it's a gas to a liquid. Melting, which one is it? That's right, solid to a liquid. Freezing, which one is it? That's right, liquid to a solid. Evaporation, which one is it? That's right, liquid to a gas. And then sublimation is the last one. It's directly from a solid to a gas. So, the experiment then. You could set up an experiment like this. Set up the apparatus. So you've got a beaker, you've got some ice, and you're going to warm it up with a Bunsen burner. And you record the temperature every minute for five minutes usually. Or you can do it for every 30 seconds or so. And then you plot the, the graph of what's happening to the temperature with the thermometer. Now, in school, I've done this with my class, with 9U, but I don't think the other classes have done it yet. We use stearic acid, this kind of wax, to look at the melting point. We melt the, the wax as so it turns into a liquid, and then we let it cool down. So we plot a cooling curve, rather than a heating curve, because this one's a heating curve. Now you can see what happens. So you plot your time here, and your temperature here, and then you'll see, and then you plot a line of best fit. Well, it's not technically a line of best fit, because it's got a funny shape. So when you plot it, you'll see this. So this was ice, remember, and it was like in the minus figures. And as, it, as you heat it up, it gets warmer, obviously, because you're heating it with the Bunsen burner. But then watch what happens. As the ice starts to turn to water, you'll get a mixture of ice and water. At that point, which is the point at which the ice is melting into water, it's a mixture of ice and water, look what happens four minutes between three four five minutes six minutes now between four five and six minutes that's the bit at which it's melting here I'm gaining energy by heating it up this ice is starting to vibrate the particles are vibrating gaining more and more and more and more energy eventually they break away and start to become a liquid but until all of the particles have broken away freely, so that means I've got a mixture of liquid and solid, water and ice, the temperature cannot get any higher. Okay, so the temperature starts to stay the same. The temperature stays the same while there's ice and water mixed. Once all of the ice has melted, the heat then, the temperature starts to rise again because now it's just water. And if I continue doing that, and I heat it up and heat it up and heat it up, and if I do a line of best fit there, eventually it'll go flat at 100 degrees Celsius again because the water will be boiling and it will reach the boiling point. And at that point, you'll have a mixture of water and steam. And while it's just water and steam, it'll go flat like this at 100 degrees Celsius. And then, once it's all turned to steam, and if it's in a contained system, obviously steam can evaporate and go everywhere around the room and you can't sort of capture it. But if you had it in a contained system, steam can go above 100 degrees Celsius. And that's like superheated steam, which is very dangerous. Uh, burn more than normal boiling water would. So, this is what a melting curve looks like. And a cooling curve will look exactly the same, but the opposite way around. It'll go from hot to cold. and It'll go flat like this, and it'll go down like that. But the idea is, that the line always goes flat at its melting point and it'll go flat at its boiling point. So where on the graph represents the ice? Well, the ice is here. So between zero and four minutes. 
and then where on the graph represents water? Well, water is going to be here, because here is a mixture of ice and water. So six minutes onwards is just water. Why does the temperature not increase between four and six minutes, even though it was still being heated by the Bunsen burner? Now this is what I'm going to talk about next time when we start talking about internal energy. It's because the heat energy from the Bunsen burner was being used to break the particle bonds and not to raise the temperature. So the, what's happening here is the bonds are being broken. The energy that's going in and in and in from the Bunsen burner is breaking those bonds until all those bonds are broken and then the temperature can start to rise again. We call that energy the potential energy of the particles. The temperature though, as it rises, is to do with the kinetic energy of those particles. The higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy of those particles. They go, go around with more and more energy. But we're going to talk about that next time because we're going to talk about internal energy in our next lesson. So here's another graph showing exactly the same thing. It looks like that. And here's the explanation. So this flat line shows where the energy is being used to break the bonds. This has been done during melting. And here, with the same thing, the flat line here shows the energy being used to push the particles further apart for evaporation of all here, it will be boiling, okay, because it's 100 degrees Celsius, water will be boiling, okay? So we call this a heating curve. So have to recognize that these lines are flat and flat. Now here's a question for you. On a cold freezing day, uh, before we go to school in the morning and go on, on the way to work and stuff, why do the gritters grit the road the night before? Well, because overnight the temperature might fall below zero. Now, if it falls maybe one or two degrees below zero, and it rains overnight, the water on the roads will turn to ice, and people driving around, will, the cars will be skidding and sliding over the place and cause accidents. So they grit the road. What's grit? Grit is just a mixture of these little stones, little rocks with little salt in there. So it's just salt, rock salt. What does the salt do? Well, salt makes the water impure. It's no longer pure water. Well, it's never pure water anyway, but it's, it's now it's a mixture of salt and water. But what does that do? It actually lowers the melting point of water. So the temperature now where water melts or freezes goes lower. Same thing for a pot of water. Why do chefs add water uh, when they're boiling a pan of water to, make, to cook the pasta? Why do they add a pinch of salt? Why? Because it actually lowers the boiling point of water. So the water will boil much faster. Also, they add the salt to season the water, to season the, the food that you're cooking to give it a bit of a saltier taste. But the temperature here and here goes lower. And that's why the temperature might hit minus two overnight, but if the salts made it make water uh, freeze at minus four, therefore the probability of there being frozen road reduces. So therefore there's less chance of accidents happening during the morning rush hour traffic. Okay, so that's why that happens. So, um, that's our heating curve then. So, You will do a practical on this, so we call that the melting point, and then we call this the boiling point, where it goes flat. Now you will do a practical, and then uh, obviously if you keep heating it up further, it'll go higher and higher and higher. Solid there, liquid there, gas there, but in between, on this line, it'll be solid plus liquid. On this line here, it'll be liquid plus gas, because it's a mixture of both. So that's just basically what we've just been talking about on that previous little graph. It just matches up the different things. On show my homework, go through the PowerPoint, go through all the stuff, but I've managed to get through all the information that you need to know. Here is the key points. So particles of, a fix, uh, particles of solid are held together uh, to each other in fixed positions. They are least energetic of all states of matter. Particles of a liquid move about at random and are, are in contact with each other. They are more energetic than particles in a solid, as like we said. The particles of a gas move about randomly and are far apart, so gases are much less dense than solids and liquids. They are more energetic uh, of the states of matter. When a substance changes state, its mass stays the same because they, the number of particles stay the same. So when you change state, because you have the same number of uh, particles, it's the same mass. When you melt ice and it turns liquid, the mass is exactly the same. There's no particles being lost. So ice and water would weigh the same amount, okay? The densities would be different because ice would actually 
spread further about, apart. That's why the ice will actually float on top of the water, but their actual mass themselves will be the same. Um, for the same amount of water, obviously. Now, the last thing we looked at then, for a pure substance, its melting point is the temperature at which it melts, which is the same temperature as which it solidifies. Uh, its boiling point is the temperature at which it boils, which is the same temperature at which it condenses. Energy is needed to melt a solid or, a, or to boil a liquid. Boiling occurs throughout a liquid as its boiling point. At its boiling point, evaporation occurs from the surface of a liquid when its temperature is below its boiling point. The flat section of a, of a temperature time graph gives the melting point or the boiling point of that substance. Okay, so there's some exam questions for you to the guys to have a go at. Hope you've learned something today on states of matter and the changing of state. I forgot to give you a virtual high five from the last, uh, from the first five questions. I uh, hope to see you next time where we're going to look at uh, internal energy and specific related heat. Take care and I'll see you next time. Virtual high five from me.